before we bring up our brother Mahmoud, inshallah ta'ala, I just wanted to say a few words about him. And many of you might not remember, I'd assume at least half of this hall might not remember, in the 1990s, before Black Lives Matter, before Colin Kaepernick, before social media, before it was popular to take a stand against some of the actions of the United States government, SubhanAllah, there was this one brother who was willing in the midst of the Gulf War to take a stand against U.S. militarism. And I know him from Louisiana. He went to LSU. He was Chris Jackson at the time. And Alhamdulillah, through reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, found his way to Islam and took this stance, this honorable stance against U.S. militarism that we had never seen before. And I want you all who have seen the way that Colin Kaepernick was exiled from the NFL yet had popular support to think about a man who really faced the brunt of anger from the political establishment in the United States, from the NBA, and even from his fellow players. It was not a popular stance, and it reminds me of the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he says, Man tawada'a, whoever lowers himself for Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate him. Decades later, you have a new Showtime documentary that will be coming out, inshallah ta'ala, in 2023. You have Colin Kaepernick, who is openly crediting Mahmoud Abdul Rauf for being the person that gave him the inspiration to take the stand that he took. You have players around the leagues, the superstars today, saying that he was the superstar before we were the superstars. And you have an entire country now, alhamdulillah, that's coming to realize the profound stance that he took. And he did this at the time, and he did this, you know, he does this today, and he says that it is his Islam, it is his religion that forces him to take a principled stance in this day and age in the face of such a brutal machine. And so inshallah ta'ala, we would like to present this year's Muhammad Ali Confident Muslim Award to Brother Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. I'd like to welcome Brother Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, inshallah ta'ala, our 2022 Confident Muslim, Muhammad Ali Confident Muslim of the year. Let me take it out, inshallah. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Um, uh, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here in, in front of you. Um, first, let me just begin by thanking Allah, and I pray that Allah will continue for all of us to open up the doorways to Jannah, to guide our steps. You know, uh, Allah is the fashion of reality. We pray that he will uh, continue to nourish us in the ingredients of this deen to, to always be a voice and an example, uh, you know, uh, for what he pushes us towards, inshallah. Um, this is special. Uh, let me, and let me say this. Uh, Muhammad Ali um, uh, set the bar. I mean, he raised the bar very high for us, um, not just in the field of athletics, but, but also not only in the ring, but also outside of the ring. Um, and even as a, as a young man, not just myself, but millions of, of people aspired to be like him. You know, his, his, his skill level was just immaculate. Um, his, his quickness, his, his footwork, uh, the way he thought, you know, the, the fighting game, um, and we as athletes, you know, I'm a basketball player, but we strove to be like him in our respective fields, in our respective sports, but even in his own sport, you know, by creating these little games in our neighborhoods of, um, of, of these homemade boxing matches that we would have with each other and then this, 
fighting, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, shadow boxing, you know, doing all of that stuff. And because you know, this is the impact that he had on us. You know, even when he would, would lose, we would be in tears like somebody died in our family because of, because of what he represented, not only in the sport of boxing, but equally so, if not more, just the person that he was. We tried to emulate that. We wanted to be, you know, in so many ways like Muhammad Ali. And I just, just talking about it makes me tear up. Um, because he, he represented a person that, you know, his faith, his conviction, you know, his wit, his poetry, uh, uh, his courage, you know, his, his, his uh, being oriented towards justice, you know, and, and he did all of this, I think, from a place of love, you know, because you can't sustain this type of commitment to Islam and this commitment to humanity if you don't have love in your heart. And he showed that time and time again. And it reminds me of a saying, I don't know who coined the phrase that justice is what love looks like in public. Right, because he always was fighting for that, irrespective of, of, of a person's uh, faith, irrespective of a person's nationality, irrespective of a person's race. And it kind of reminds me also of what Huey P. Newton, in one of his books, uh, what, in his book, uh, Revolutionary Suicide, mentions, you know, about the difference between revolutionary suicide and, and reactionary suicide, basically giving your life for something. And he said, it's not that we have a death wish, he said it's quite the opposite. He said is that we have such a desire to live with peace and dignity that the existence without it is impossible. And so I think when I think about, you know, Muhammad Ali and the impact that he had, and because this, this, this confident uh, award is named after him, because of all of that, it just means, you know, for me that much more uh, that, that I, would, I would be honored, you know, we... We, we, we seek our reward from Allah, you know, ultimately, but it's really nice when your peers and when people in your faith can see something in you, even though we may at times agree to disagree <laughs> of, of our worth, but they can see something in you that uh, makes you think of, you know, this, this type of person and, and representing this type of faith. So... I'm deeply honored uh, and I'm grateful uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, by Allah uh, to you for recognizing me for this prestigious award. So again, I want to thank you, alhamdulillah. Um, you know, I grew up in Mississippi about seven hours, I think, seven, seven and a half hours away from here. And I grew up in a Christian background and I grew up also with a disorder, Tourette syndrome, and I wasn't diagnosed until the 11th grade. And I was always taught the value of prayer and praying for someone, praying for others more than you pray for yourself, you know. And by doing so, moving toward what you're praying for, and there's a greater chance if you do that, that your prayers will be answered. But along the way, as a young man, I had questions. And oftentimes these questions that I had, I would get two responses. That you just got to believe or you can't question God. And that disturbed me as a young man. Fast forwarding as the years progressed, and I prayed a lot. I prayed religiously. I prayed when I was walking. I prayed on my knees. I, pray, I mean constantly. And as the years progressed, I ended up going to LSU. And I'm going to fast forward, skip a lot. Dale Brown, the, the, the coach of LSU, gave me the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I'd never heard of who Malcolm was up to that point, sadly. And I began to read his story. And this is kind of in line with also the likes of Muhammad Ali and what, what he was able to exemplify in his character and in his voice. But Malcolm just fascinated me with the person that he was, you know, how he thought, uh, his fearlessness, you know, his courage, 
how he stood up for issues and didn't seem to care what anybody or anyone thought. And why that was important for me was because I grew up in the South. You know, I was born 1969, so I grew up in the 70s and 80s. And I remember vividly as a child, and I would see the relationships that existed between whites and blacks. And I couldn't put my finger on it, right? But I knew something wasn't right with this picture that I was seeing. And it disturbed me. But I was also brought up in a society where you're taught, you know, just play the game, keep your mouth shut, right? This is just the way things are. And I noticed early that it was just when I would, when I would keep my mouth shut, when I would be silent, it bothered me internally. It was just hard for me to sleep. And I just felt, even at that age, I, say, I just felt like a coward. And I didn't like the way that felt. I, I didn't like the way that felt. And I would always pray to God, please put me in a position to where I could be a voice for, for people, where I could stand up for myself, where I could say what I think and what I feel, regardless of the consequences. And seeing the likes of a Muhammad Ali, learning about a Malcolm, looking at these examples, right, begin to over time. And I think this is why it's so important, the power of storytelling. Right. The power of association, the things that, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves, the things that we're associated with, because the more we do that, we find that there's going to be there's strength in those things. And so make a long story short, I ended up as I'm looking at his life. And, and I'm thinking about my life growing up in the South and the things that I went through. These these were personalities. I'm like, man, I want to be like that. I want to have that type of strength. Right to stand up, regardless if people accept it or not, to stand up for what I believe in, whatever the consequences are. And so I ended up, you know, by Allah, uh, through reading the autobiography of Malcolm, embracing Islam after my first year in the NBA. And I joke about that now, because you spend most of your life, you know, waking up in the morning, like literally I was waking up at four o'clock in the morning, and I'm on the court at five. And I'm talking about thunder and lightning. You're talking about freezing, coming home with frostbitten hands. I want a success so bad. I'm like, man, I got to make it. You know, I got to make it. So I joke, but I say, Allah, why did you wait till I get to the NBA and I'm making all of this bread for me to become conscious? <laughs> right? And to, I joke, I'm, the, I'm so grateful I don't have any, any regrets whatsoever. But everything happens for a reason. You know, Allah sends you where he wants you at, at a timing of his choice. But, and I'm saying this, those things for me, that was huge. You know, growing up with a mother with an eighth grade education, you taught, as I said before, you know, I would see my parents when they had to confront white people, their head would be down, right? Very soft spoken, like they couldn't say what was on their mind, but in private, boy, they'd be bold, right? And courageous and saying all of this stuff. And I found myself doing the same thing as a, as a young child. And I said, I don't like the way this feels. I need to step out of this. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I need to step out of it. And so if it wasn't for those types of people like the Muhammad Ali, like the Malcolm X's that led me to Islam. And then you're reading the stories about the prophet, right? And well, Allah says, stand up for justice, even if it's against yourself, right? All of these things that you're constantly, and then meeting people on the road, Muslims coming on the road. And mo my best education was by traveling. And every city I went to, Muslims would come to the hotel, and we would find ourselves up two, three, four o'clock in the morning just talking dean, just talking about life, society, politics. They're introducing me to books and authors that I'd never heard before in my life. Now I'm reading like I've never read before. And as I'm reading and I'm, I'm associated with these people, as, as Allah says, be in the company of the righteous, right? There's, there's, there's benefits in those things. They've done studies. They said if you're trying to gain weight, I mean, if you're trying to be in shape, hang around people that's in shape. If you're trying to be moral, hang around moral people. If you're trying to be an activist, hang around activists. Why? There's a, there's, a, there's a conversation. It's a lifestyle. There's a pattern in their conversations. There's a pattern in their behavior 
that you're constantly surrounded by and eventually it's going to rub off. And so this is what I began to do. And the more that I began to be in these circles, I started developing strength. And the more that I began to become a little bit more knowledgeable, I began to share. And you realize when you share information, oftentimes there's a lot of people that think just like you. And then there's another level to that. As you're sharing, you're like, you know what? Now you start developing confidence. And then the confidence eventually turns into courage. Like, I got to do something with this information. As Allah says, don't be like a donkey with books on your back. You got all this information. What you going to do with it? And so these are the things that I'm thinking about daily. People don't know that when I was in the league, I would... How many of you have heard of the message, The Life of the Prophet, the movie? Battle of Algiers. In it? All right. Uh, Lion of the Desert. I used to take these movies with me on the road when I was a Muslim. And then we had this huge, uh, I'm telling my age, huge VCR, <laughs> portable, just like this, this big. And I would stick my little VC VCR in, in the machine. I'm in the hotel and I'm watching these movies. I'm getting hyped. But also I used to have this VCR about the war in Chechnya. And they were showing gruesome images of Muslims being blown up, their private parts being dismembered. And I'm watching this. And people don't know, I'm, I'm reading all of this stuff about what's going in, on in the world, but also I'm looking at these images. And even though I, could, I wasn't there and I couldn't be there, so to speak, my heart was always, always trying to stay connected because there's a tendency sometimes when you're in the limelight and you have the fame and you have the wealth for those things to become a distraction for you. This is why it was important for me to stay in those circles. Muhammad Ali would talk about that a lot also, staying in those circles. You know, Malcolm X. So I would look at these videos and I would come to the game and before the jump ball, you know how you greet, greet, your, greet the opponent. I'm not a person that mean mugs, right? I said, now shake your hand, have a good game. But in my mind and in my heart, I'm looking at you. You don't know I'm looking at you like this, but I'm looking at you like you're the reason why we're going through what we're going through in the Muslim world. And in order for me to get justice, I got to annihilate you. <laughs> Literally, I, mean, I got to kill you out here. You know, I got to dominate you. And this was my way of staying connected, staying grounded. Like, I'm always picking these little things to motivate me. You know, whether it, basketball, the same, you have those things of thinking about my mom, I'm thinking about helping people that get you up in the morning. So the same with your, your Islamic responsibilities, right? You gotta constantly, you know, stay connected to these stories, which is why an organization like Yaqeen, you know, the think tank, the research is so important because these things constantly, because a lot of us, we don't feel we have the time and there are people that's doing this research, we can just go to it and go to that paper and we can look it up and it's right there. It can help guide us, you know, through, through, through what we're going through and our understanding of things. So um, I can keep going on and on, but for me, there's a couple of things that stay with me. There's so many, but I want to leave you with this. And this is what keeps me going among so many others. You know, there's a famous hadith that I know we're all familiar with. It says, no one... Um, don't, nah, don't let me forget now. I say this hadith all the time. Uh, whoever begins their day and they're not concerned with the affairs of the Muslims, or some would say, because Islam is just not about what, what, what affects us, but what affects humanity. Whoever begins their day and they're not concerned with the affairs of humanity, they're not of this ummah. Right? And it's imperative that we stay connected. There's so much that's happening in the world today. And I know we all know it. And the more we stay connected, the more we keep telling these stories, the stronger we'll become. I really believe this from the bottom of my heart. And George Washington Carver says something. He says, um, no one has the right to come into this world and leave it without leaving behind distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. You know, we all should be trying to find out what type of legacy do we want to leave? Right? You know, when it's all said and done. And for me, there's no greater legacy than the legacy of 
of being connected to this dean and always pushing toward issues of justice and fairness and equity and equality. So may Allah reward you. Thank you for this award. It's very special to me. And please, as much as possible, continue to support uh, Yaqeen Institute. I love you. Assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah. Takbir. Takbir. SubhanAllah. First of all, we have to correct our brother Shaq, MashaAllah. He's a Muslim. You know, Mahmoud is a servant of God. All right? <laughs> but um, to see the, I think, the, the admiration that people have for you, not just on the court, but, but really off the court. And SubhanAllah, to see it come full circle. A lot of times it takes time for people to recognize what they're seeing. And when Muhammad Ali, rahimahullah, passed away, there were so many people that were praising him that were the same people that were at the forefront of criticizing him. And people forget he was, one, he was the most hated man in the country at some point. For you to have taken that stand, I think that the question that I would ask, can you point to a moment where you found something in your deen, in your faith, and you said, you know what? It's worth it. A moment when you're reading the Quran, a moment when you're making dua, where you found something in your faith that you felt like, there is no way I'm going to relinquish this, even if the whole world stands against me. That's a great question. Um, no, I can't think of one particular moment. It's just a... Uh, I remember the... the before I was a Muslim, the, the first day I picked up the Quran. And there was this guy named Mark James, we were very close. And uh, Islam came up in conversation. And so we went to the masjid, make a long story short, came back, I was excited. And I picked it up two, three pages later. And I, I can't remember the, the, the actual verses, but I remember to this day the way it made me feel. And that feeling has never left. And I remember looking across the table after reading two, three pages. I looked at him. I said, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be a Muslim. My search is over. And I was once asked, I said, well, what is it about Islam that, that attracts you? I said, from the first day until now, every time I pick up the Quran and, and engage it, it never fails to satisfy my curiosity and to answer my questions, you know, on any, any issue. So uh, that's, I hope that's my answer. Wow. What, what happens to you, you know, when you're in that moment and you're seeing, I mean, I think at that time, right, it wasn't just non-Muslims turning their back on you. This is a climate in which even Muslims are saying, no, no, he doesn't represent us. Yeah. You know, we stand for the national anthem. We're proud Muslims, proud American Muslims. What does that do for you in terms of your personal connection, your dua, your prayer, and finding from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that strength? What would you say to someone that feels that sense of peer pressure, right? And feels that sense of loneliness and abandonment and how you connect to dua in those moments? You know, I, I always knew that even though we're all Muslim, we don't all think the same. You know, it's not, we're not a monolith on everything, on every issue. So I understood that there was going to be differences of opinions. Uh, for me, uh, I never allowed that to create in me this sense of, because the media is great trying to divide and conquer. Even when Hakeem, my dear brother, said what he said about we follow the laws of the land and people try to make a big deal of that, I was always, look, that's my brother, you know, X, Y, and Z. And plus, you never know the full extent of the interview. You know, they do a lot of chopping and cutting and editing. Um, but um, I can't remember yet. My mind is in. You know, for me, how, how would I help someone? For me, it's always been, and, and I was fortunate to, to be around a group of a lot of Muslims and just, just the value of constantly engaging the Quran. You know, a lot, the blueprint is the Quran. And, 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 and for me, it's just, that's where the answers are. And just seeking those answers. And once you find them, owning them. You know, owning them uh, uh, fully. Uh, not that you're not going to come across something that could, could, could increase that understanding, but, but for me, once, 
unless you can tell me something and convince me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to it. I'm going to stick to it regardless. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mashallah. Can you tell me about how Colin Kaepernick, you know, mashallah, I think he had you write the foreword to his book, right? Or, or he's got, he had you, he cited you as an example in regards to the stance that he took. What's that relationship like between you and him? And when's our brother taking shahada? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know, mashallah. Um, I know he's in contact with a Muslim sister uh, that he sees, but, um, you know, we had a great conversation the first time we met in, in, in Oakland uh, from a mutual friend named Hashem. Uh, we spoke for about an hour, um, and we never, gave, we never gave each other advice because there's a tendency with athletes, you know, you don't have a mind of your own. Somebody had to tell you what to do, so we just shared information, and what I said resonated with him and vice versa. We just took it, but he said something that, that, that stuck with me. He said, this is the most free that he's ever felt in his life. And that's what enabled him to be able to, to, to do what he did. Um, yeah, but as far as the, the Muslim piece, only Allah knows. <laughs> Next year we'll have him as a confident Muslim, inshallah, Tana, if you can, if you can work your magic, inshallah. Inshallah. You know, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna hold you too long, inshallah, Tana, but really, I mean, you know, you gave up your NBA career. You gave up a lot of this dunya. And a lot of people probably look at that and wonder, was it really worth it? And are there, you know, what do you say to someone like that, right? You know, that does it, does it ever get to you that you, gave, you turned your back on being the most celebrated player in the league, you know, someone that was just on the up and up, and when people say the Steph Curry before the Steph Curry and what could have been? Or do you just look towards, inshallah ta'ala, what the reward is going to be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and derive strength from that? That's the main thing for me. Uh, and I know it sounds cliche and it sounds good, but literally, I could care. When I became a Muslim, there were people saying, look, man, what about endorsements? I said, I can care less about endorsements. Right. You know, I'm concerned about my relationship with Allah. I'm not perfect. Nobody is. But uh, that's the most important thing to me. And I don't look at it as, I really don't look at it as a loss. You know, Allah sends us where he wants us to be for reasons. You know, and, and I look at it, look, man, I've, you know, one of, my, one of my goals in life was not to be that, I made a commitment. I said, I want to live and die with a free conscience and a free soul, whether people like it or not. And so when you look at the history of prophets, Allah says about the Prophet Sallallahu that this message almost broke his back. They, they, they went through way more than we would ever go through. So this is just part and parcel of, you know, trying to live according to your faith. You know, these, these, are, these, are the, these are the outcomes. So I don't look at it as a loss. I look at it as a gain. You know, if I'm gaining more of a connection with Allah, what can be, what can be better than that? You know, yeah, so mashallah. I got one more question for you, inshallah, and it's, it's more of an advice. You know, alhamdulillah, you got a lot of young Muslims in here, and they're looking at you, and their eyes got big because they were born after uh, the 1990s, and they didn't realize who you were until they watched the Showtime trailer. And a lot of people are going to learn about you, inshallah, Tata, when that, when that documentary comes out, inshallah, on Showtime, and... Your, your name and your example will, will be known to a lot of people that might not have known about it before. But to the young Muslims in the room that feel a lot of peer pressure, being a Muslim in America, post 9-11, some of them weren't even around or they don't even remember 9-11, but they feel the pressure of being Muslim and they feel at times this necessity to relinquish part of their Muslimness in order to fit in. What are some words of encouragement you could give to those young Muslims in the room who are looking at you and, and wondering how you gave it all up for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I'm, I'm a firm believer, and I said a little bit of it in the speech. I, I think, you know, when, I, when we talk about Islam as the blueprint, all throughout the Quran, Allah tells us, you know, how to develop confidence, how to develop courage, how to do all those things. And so when I look at even the verse where Allah says, be in the company of the righteous, right? The more we associate with the right types of people, we're around the right type of uh, information, it rubs off and you develop, you, de you develop the confidence, you develop the courage to, to, to stand your ground. And that's what did it for me. And the more you do that, you will find that people will end up respecting you for it. Yeah, there's gonna be rough spots, you're gonna be challenged, that's with everything. But I found that when it was all said and done, man, people, they look at you, they approach you differently. 
You know, I remember Bernie Bickerstaff would come into the, to the, to the locker room sometimes, and he would grab people's head and play with them. He would go down the line, and then he would come to me. I know, because of the way you carry yourself, you know, and then the conversations are going to be different. Uh, and so you just have to stay the course. You have, to, you have to own it. You have to embrace it. And the more consistent you are, people will eventually turn, and they'll begin to, you know, respect is, I'd rather, if I had a choice between you liking me and respecting me, respect me. Yeah, I want you to respect me, first and foremost. MashaAllah. What a line, MashaAllah. Allahu Akbar. If I had a choice between people liking me or respecting me, I'll choose respect any time. You know, there's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, whoever pleases the people by displeasing Allah, Allah will be displeased with them and Allah will cause the people to be displeased with them. But whoever pleases Allah by displeasing the people, Allah will be pleased with them and Allah will cause the people to be pleased with him as well. And SubhanAllah, we saw that your life is, is literally a testimony to that, that here we are three decades later and now they're celebrating you after they made you uh, a demon in this country, vilified you in this country and now Alhamdulillah Rabbil Ameen, the respect is there but as we said, you know, we, we love you and we're proud of you and, and you know, congratulations once again on the award and Jazakallah Khair for coming down and being with us tonight. Everyone, inshallah ta'ala, please give one more round of applause for Brother Mahmoud. And inshallah ta'ala, with that, we're going to go ahead and conclude the evening. Uh, and once again, jazakumullah khairan to all of you. I just need one more commitment from you all. How many of you will be at the banquet next year, inshallah? Can I see hands? Uh, some of you are like, uh, Dr. Altaf, you're going to be at the banquet next year, inshallah? Inshallah. All right. Inshallah ta'ala, we pray that you'll continue to be with us every year. Oh, mashallah. So just to update on the, on the funds, before, before I make dua, Tamam said, hold the dua. Yeah. Allahu Akbar. Takbir. Takbir. Mashallah. So we're at 835,000. And to... To honor, oh, you want to say, do, no, you no, want to no. go ahead and raise the rest? <laughs> <laughs> my, my flight is at Fajr. No, 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 no. <laughs> but inshallah ta'ala, you know, to honor, I think, you know, Dr. Ahmadi raised the bar for us. SubhanAllah, we came in here and our goal was 500,000. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless everyone who contributed. But to honor that, inshallah, my request to everyone is that video that you saw, the end of your video, it's going to go live, inshallah ta'ala, soon. Share it with your circles and try to raise, inshallah ta'ala, and let's hope that we can hit that amount from this room, b'ithnillahi ta'ala. And we ask you to keep on coming back, inshallah, and we thank you for your support. I'm going to make a dua, inshallah ta'ala, that we can con conclude with, inshallah ta'ala. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه إن الله لا يخلف الميعاد اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك oh Allah we ask you to guide our hearts and to guide other hearts through our hearts we ask you oh Allah to rectify our condition and to rectify the condition of others through us we ask you oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask you to use us for this deen we ask you not to replace us with anyone else. Ya Allah, use us in whatever capacity is best for us in our akhirah. Ya Allah, use us in whatever capacity is best for us in our akhirah. Ya Allah, do not let us be amongst those who are deluded or who are replaced. Ya Allah, do not let us be amongst those who are misguided or discarded. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, even if it is just our dua, Ya Allah, we ask you to accept our dua. Ya Allah, we ask you to uplift the condition of Islam and the Muslims all over the world. Ya Allah, we ask you to uplift the condition of humanity through Islam and through the Muslims all over the world. Ya Allah, we ask you to support the oppressed wherever they are. Ya Allah, we ask you to use us to support the oppressed wherever they are. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us worthy of this beautiful deen and this beautiful da'wah. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept our efforts despite our shortcomings. 
and to enter us into paradise despite our sins. Ya Allah, we ask you to remove any grudges, any ill will, anything between us that divides our hearts. Ya Allah, unite our hearts and connect them to you. Ya Allah, unite our ranks and connect us to you. Ya Allah, we ask you to allow us to leave this gathering amongst those who are accepted, amongst those who are forgiven. Ya Allah, do not let us leave with any sin left upon us. Allahumma ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam mubarak ala abdika wa rasulika Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakum Allah khayran. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha. Tastaghfiruka wa atubu alayk. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.